What is the stupidest thing you've done with respect to your privacy? Join Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, probably like the entire, like when I was sort of a one, like, like Farhad, just like signing up for, none of it meant anything to me. Like I signed up for every service pretty much. There was just this time, it's probably like, between 2008 and like 2013, where it was like, if it's new and interesting, it's like my job to you know figure it out. And like, I'm pretty sure I gave like my social security to some companies or something. You know, uh, it was pretty reckless. Fell in love with a guy who uses Alexa, <laughs> and then we moved in together, and then I made him take Alexa down. <laughs> but there was a period of uh, stupidity there. Yes, I just fell in love with Alexa. <laughs> that was the main thing. Uh, no, it's like all the things. Um, I mean, Facebook, uh, all the things Charlie said, like just sort of, I, I mean, we write about it, so I f also felt that professional duty to kind of try things out. I, um, and I'm, and I don't know, you've all experienced this when you're kind of signing up for things, you're in this like altered state where everything seems like it's gonna be great after you press agree, so yeah. Finally, um, what's the most extreme thing you do to protect your privacy? Um, I live in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, that's the end of your answer. That's the end of my answer. Okay. Uh, I file a special form with the Oregon Elections Board to hide my address and they fuck it up every time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have cursed. This is a library. Yeah, I don't know if it's extreme, but like that's, that's the thing I worry about, people knowing my address. My address used to be somewhat easy to find. I got, I've gotten doxxed before, um, and like there's all these services that I've signed up for. See, I can't stop signing up for services to, to like get my address off, and like I filed those forms, but it still seems like an uphill battle. So it's not extreme, and it's just like I'm losing. I had to take a picture of my driver's license to use one of those, like, wipe you off the internet forms. I was like, this feels like a real catch-22 here. <laughs> exactly. Like, too much information. We're actually going to talk more about addresses later. But for now, I want to get a sense of how you and the audience feel. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First, I want everyone to put your hand up. We'll first be talking about social media websites like Facebook. Um, and we're interested to see where you personally think you would draw the line or what would be too much for you when it comes to privacy. So keep your hand up until I say something that would make you kind of shake your head and say, no, that's a step too far. So when it comes to social media websites, if you're comfortable when a website collects detailed personal information about you, like your gender and your interest, keep your hand up. If you're not, put it down. Wow, okay. This, this game might end sooner than I thought. Um, if you're comfortable when the website uses your friend's posts to send you targeted advertisements, keep your hands up. If not, wow, okay, put them down. If you're comfortable when a social media website receives information on what you buy in physical stores, keep your hand up. And finally, if you're comfortable, if, if they know when you walk into a physical location um, because you share, share it with your phone app, keep your hand up. Or if you would draw the line here, put it down. Okay, we're going to have to talk to you later <laughs> to get your perspective. Um, one more topic, smart doorbells. So these, of course, are the doorbells with a little camera on them. Everyone, please put your hand up again. If you're comfortable with a doorbell that sends video and images to your phone so you can see who's at your door, keep your hand up. It's kind of what it's for, right? Um, if you're comfortable with a doorbell that learns familiar faces so it can identify known and unknown people, keep your hand up. If you're comfortable with a doorbell that gives law enforcement video clips, if, the, if, if they're served a valid, a valid warrant, keep your hand up. Okay, we have like four or five people left, so I'll do the last one. If you're comfortable with the doorbell that gives law enforcement access to its network of real-time video streams, keep your hand up. If not, put it down. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, 
Farhad actually wrote a piece that said it's time to panic about privacy. So I'm interested in getting his thoughts about the audience reaction here and if yeah, they're panicked enough doorbells. or yeah. too much. Um, no, it seems like they're they're a good level of panicked. Um, <laughs> good job. The doorbells, like the doorbells, especially scare me. I don't have one of those smart doorbells, but like the idea. Generally, the thing that has uh, worried me more and more over the last few years is the proliferation of cameras everywhere. Um, you know, it started with we we take cameras around with our on our smartphones, um, and so now you're being recorded by like anyone who. who who has a camera, um, and you don't have much say over where your image goes um, or your voice or anything else. Um, but now it's like, in other than the people around you, like the objects have cameras, um, cars have cameras, like s airplane seat backs have cameras, uh, doorbells have cameras. And what I worry about really is like these images being, you know, they're all uh, cross reference to your location, to time. Um, there's this kind of massive surveillance system being created. And because we're consumers and buying this stuff and like tying it to the cloud, we're like a part of it. Um, so, yeah, the cameras uh, and, the, and like us buying it for these doorbells and other things, even though they seem super convenient, and I m would want one of those doorbell cameras just for like some of the conveniences, they seem um, just like a step too far. The, yeah. Sarah and Charlie, do you have thoughts? I mean, for me, it's it's just like, why? Like, in, like it's, I'm so many whys down the line that like at this point, the doorbells thing is is just in another universe. I think that when we started putting, uh, do you know there's cameras on Peloton exercise bikes? I like, I, when I realized this, I, I, I don't, don't even know what to say. Like you're gonna pay that much money to have an exercise bike look at you. Like that's so strange. I just do not understand what the market thinks that we want, essentially. Um, and there's, there is this prevailing assumption that this is what people want, but it's like, no, advertisers tell you what you want. We're just moving further and further along this path, um, accepting this wisdom that we do want more surveillance, but you just saw the hands in this room. Like, it's true that we are all being tracked in these ways and that it's incredibly common, and you're dead right that all of the stuff that Janae listed is actually happening, but that doesn't mean we're comfortable with it. We just have to do it because we don't really have much of a choice. Like, what are we going to do, throw our smartphones in the ocean? I can't find my way from Civic Center to the library. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think one, th I think a real problem right now, I, I think we're in this, this transitional period where we're, we're starting to reckon with all this stuff. And, and I think one of the big issues is just like transparency. I mean, like the, the reports that came out this week and that have kind of like trickled out about law enforcement partnering with, with the system and then it's, it's this like this closed loop that is sort of undisclosed. I mean, that kind of transparency is just like is broadly unacceptable. Like you can't, you can't have these partnerships with law enforcement that, that people don't know. I mean, then you are just actually creating like a surreptitious surveillance system. Now, gr granted, if, you know, if people know these things, there is a, there is a report about uh, it, it, like I've been thinking a lot about this transparency stuff. There was a, a report in the Guardian about uh, workers at Apple who were, you know, uh, have to listen to some of the Siri requests, and they were overhearing people like having sex or arguing and these things. And to me, the big thing is not that that's happening. That can you can obviously be outraged by that, but it's the fact that it's not disclosed. I mean, I understand that there's a you know a human infrastructure underneath technology. The problem is that we, some of these companies have gotten so brazen that they don't feel like they need to disclose this, that they feel like they can do all this underneath the surface. And that's, that, that's the thing that I think needs to, like, that we really need to reckon with, is the disclosure and the understanding, giving consumers power. Yeah, but some of these things are sort of more, um, the way that you sell the technology is to sort of cover up the way it works. Um, the way that kind of Silicon Valley has worked for a long time is to kind of tell you the great things that are going to be available with this technology. Um, and usually it means like, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's some level of convenience or like ease of use or some other thing that you haven't been able to do before. Um, and in all of that, it takes a certain level of kind of consumer understanding to know how it works and to see the risks there. So like the doorbell thing, if you think about it for a second, um, it, 
you can see all of the real, really scary things, like the way that the camera, um, the image from the camera gets to your phone is it's sent through a cloud server first, and uh, you know, so and it's Amazon, and Amazon um, owns the doorbell company. It owns uh, like it has access to your house because people are coming to your house all the time. Like there's all these connections there that. Uh, when you describe the entire system, sounds scary. But the way that you know technology companies sell gadgets is not to describe all that stuff. The way that kind of people understand how that stuff works is like not at a level of sophistication to understand kind of the scary things that are possible when you just buy this device that's like allows you to, you know, uh, answer the door or play music in your house or something like that. I mean, it's the same thing with like food and medicine and yeah. a, a host of other things that are regulated. Like we're just sort of at this point where. We should be regulating this stuff, but we don't have an FDA for Alexa. Mm -hmm. um, like we've we've got a system that's like wildly out of control, and we don't even have like a framework to understand what is harmful about it. Uh, we don't have an agency that is adequately staffed or adequately empowered to to assess the risk to consumers. Um, yeah, we we don't know how to in reporting on some of these things. Like we don't even know what the processes are. Like we can't actually explain them or understand them or like you 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 know uh, when, when you're looking into uh, certain parts of like just say like the programmatic advertising ecosystem like you just come up against these these black boxes these walls where it's just it, the data goes in and and stuff happens <laughs> and, and we, we don't necessarily know and like the way to get past that is is was really only having someone like become a whistleblower or tell you you know so it's I mean yeah. We're, we're in it. Well, on that note, Charlie, you've written a piece telling readers you care more about privacy than you think you do. Um, I think most people in this room might care about privacy as much as they think they do. They seem pretty informed. But when it comes to your average American, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I mean, I think that we're always, uh, what, people who want to sort of take advantage of people's privacy uh, will always say that, you know, you are by agreeing to these services, you want them, right? Um, by clicking, you know, accepting the terms uh, that, that, you know, you're making that trade off willingly. You're not, you're not necessarily. Um, but also, there's this, there's this thing of, you know, you know about Cambridge Analytica, right? Uh, and yet, you still use Facebook. <laughs> like, that is, you know, that's used as an excuse when it really doesn't, like, it, it doesn't actually affect how, how we feel. Like we, it, privacy is so overwhelming and all-encompassing that uh, you know it's it's a lot like the, the person I talked to who did a study showing that people actually do really care about this stuff. Compared it to like your four hundred one k, and basically said that like you don't walk around every hour being like I got I got to check my four hundred one k or hey I just bought you know a seven dollar latte at Blue Bottle like I I clearly don't care about my retirement savings like we're always kind of working against that because it's we have to live our lives and and it's really difficult and mentally taxing to do that it's really hard to look at your privacy in a holistic way on the internet I mean you really can't do it you're shedding information everywhere all of you shed all this information to come here tonight just by having phones on you. And so to think about that all the time and to make that trade off in your head, it's it's maddening. So you work against your own interest and and I think I think that that is, you know, that is a myth that we kind of need to dispel is that people don't care about this stuff. You do. It's just it's it's you have you have lives to live. And I would also say there's a certain amount of like fatalism involved because the whole thing in the way it's described in the way that we talk about these companies which are very powerful and big and seem to have no kind of um, uh, like regulators watching them. Um, it just seems like it, there's, a, there's a bit of like hopelessness. Like w the whole story about um, what happened to Equifax, like they uh, had this massive breach. Uh, it was unclear to me like why they were allowed to kind of continue operating as a company after that because like they failed at their one job. Um, and and um, then they have this, they come out with this like 
really underwhelming settlement that is gonna um, now the money's run out and like you're not gonna get a lot of money from it and like that's the end like I you know they suffered some uh, losses in the stock market like and uh, some executives were fired but there was no real penalty for any of this stuff and it feels like if you're a consumer like oh they all have your information they can treat it sort of like they, they're not being very um, careful in how they uh, treat your information it's kind of everywhere already and like the whole story is kind of hopeless it's really hard to with Equifax. It's like who to know who wants this company to exist. <laughs> like I, I just I have a hard time understanding like who's the person who's like, like I'd love for you to monitor my credit so that I can't buy a home. Like <laughs> what? Sarah, speaking of pieces of personal information that we don't want others to get a hold of, um, you've written that home addresses should be protected much more closely and almost liken that to social security numbers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, we used to have the, like, the yellow pages, the white pages, uh, and it was totally chill to have your home address just sort of floating around next to a telephone booth. Um, but uh, yeah, those existed too. But uh, it, it's, things have changed. Like there just has been a cultural shift where we now understand that when your home address is one Google search away, you could possibly be in danger. Um, like it is a very, very common way to harass someone. Uh, people have died from, from this, like from having their home address um, found on the internet and then someone calls the police, pretends like there's an active shooter situation, they send in a SWAT team, and then if the SWAT team overreacts, someone ends up dead. Um, and uh, the case that I'm thinking of specifically, the person who died wasn't even the person that uh, was targeted. It was a new person, a new tenant who had moved in like fairly recently. Um, the address was just an old bad address. Um, so this person just had no idea what was coming. Uh, and I think it's like very strange for us to continue to think of home addresses as this piece of public information that we just jot down everywhere. Like why? Like why do why does my physical residence need to be tied to like a, re a receiving address for paper mail, most of which is junk? Um, it it doesn't seem like it's worth giving up people's security for what is essentially a big old advertising thing slash the post office just simply hasn't changed its practices for many, many, many years. So on a slightly less terrifying note, um, is everyone familiar with the app Face App that people were using a week or two ago? Um, for those who weren't, it was an app where you could put in your picture and it would show you what you'll look like as a much older person. So Charlie, you wrote a piece about FaceApp and what it can teach us about what people do and don't understand about privacy. A, a lot of people use this and gave it all up. Yeah, FaceApp was really interesting because it was like this, I mean, it's been in the news before and it always kind of, it seems to flare up semi recent or regularly. Uh, but what was really fascinating about it wasn't just the privacy concern, like the, the virality and the privacy concern, but it was also, there was, there was a privacy concern and then a backlash to that. Uh, so uh, some people pointed out that the, the app, uh, the, the location of a lot of the developers is in St. Petersburg, Russia. And I was one of the people that sort of noticed that uh, alongside others. And then there was a backlash to that, which was like, you're Russia phobic. Like, what, you, you think Putin's behind this? Like, Putin doesn't want your stupid photos, right? And there was this, so there was this concern about that. And then there was this, Part of this backlash was, well, Facebook does the same thing. Like, if you're if you're if you don't want to give your photo to these people, you shouldn't give your photo to you know to to Facebook. They have years and years and years of all that information. And I think all the the confusion and the and the, it just shows that people are like really concerned, but don't really know where to direct that energy. Uh, we're not sure if you know we all download this app and we're like kind of giddy about it and like look at me as a baby and look at me as I'm, you know i'm older um and and it all seems like fun and then there's these stakes behind it but we don't really understand what those are and and i think it it, it just shows that we're in the middle of this real transitional period like we don't most people don't know what happens when they click 
you know, yes on the on the terms of service. They don't uh, they don't look or think to look uh, because it's on the app store. It must be completely vetted. It must be totally fine. Uh, we don't know what happens behind the scenes when we download apps. What pieces of software are in there from you know. Uh, other advertisers from other companies, people who you know who who host uh, um, their technology inside other apps. Like there's just a million things that are happening we don't understand. And so I thought FaceApp was interesting because it really sort of brought all that to bear in this incredibly compact news cycle. Did any of you choose to use it? No, I didn't. I mean, it's like the, as Charlie mentioned, this had been coming up regularly. There were like other there have been other apps that have done this, and it felt like one of those things where it's like a startup or something that comes out of nowhere and is trying to get everyone's photos. Like it just seems kind of um, the intent is seems suspect, um, and the payoff seemed low. Like seeing yourself as an older person. I mean, that's going it, to happen. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the name that got me. It, I mean, it was the combination of all of those things, and then it's the name, and it's just like ah. I feel this is a trap. This is, <laughs> this is, this is some, this is some kind of a trap. Uh, I just didn't do it because I didn't want to see myself <laughs> looking like that. It's like the opposite of a filter. And that I pretended like I was smart, and that's why I didn't do it. <laughs> um, Sarah, you have also written about the insurance industry and how surveillance is being used um, in ways that sound kind of scary. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean it's. Uh, you know, there are all of these um, uh, life insurance uh, companies, for instance, that are offering perks for people to wear their Fitbits, um, and then they adjust their premiums based on the Fitbit information. Um, life insurance companies that scour for uh, social media postings um, to, to see what your life risk Expectancy kind of is, uh, for instance, like don't don't post a lot of pictures of yourself skydiving. I guess, um, uh, yeah. So what they do is they go, oh, we're going to put you on this voluntary sort of monitoring thing, whether it's Fitbit, social media, whatever. Like got, like um, car insurance companies will do a thing where you have an app on your on your phone and um, it'll be using the accelerometer to tell how, qu how fast you're driving or when you're braking and so on and so forth. Um, and they'll say, oh, if you opt into this program, we, we can give you discounts, which that's just price discrimination, actually. Um, but if you say it, it's a discount, it sounds a lot nicer. Um, and you hear me mention these specific insurance industries, and you may have noticed that I didn't mention the health insurance industry. And it's because of the ACA. Prior to the ACA, the insurance companies were buying up data, for instance, from pharmacies in order to deny people insurance based on their pharmacy prescription histories. So wherever it's legal, insurance companies are gonna do that. Like they're going to slurp up as much data as possible um, through whatever surveillance means are out there. Uh, it, it's right now, there's this ongoing debate inside the insurance industry about whether or not it's okay to use credit scores to determine insurance premiums, um, which you may have assumed that that was already happening, but it is actually like kind of a controversial thing. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, like they're drawing together all of this data all the time, and unless they're barred by law, they'll do it. And there is this increasing concern because the data about us out there is becoming so, um, nebulous, like it's one thing to have a list of prescriptions, right? Like that's a really straightforward, oh, this person's on this, ergo they have this disease, ergo we're gonna uh, deny them coverage, right? Now imagine you have some machine learning algorithm that's going through people's Facebook uh, participation, like what Facebook groups you're in, um, or the kinds of, the, your social graphs. Um, and it's been going through this for a while, and it's now charted out like life expectancy of depending on of your associations, right? At some point, for some reason, the algorithm spits out this bias against covering for people who are all part of a Facebook group 
for uh, Burka Jean um, Havers, like uh, people who have joined a Facebook group for people who have gotten their genomes tested and they all know that they have the breast cancer gene, right? You now have genetic discrimination, but it's come out of one end of an algorithm that's a complete black box. And I think that unless we see more regulation in the future, like we're gonna see weird stuff like this happen all the time where there is some kind of illegal discrimination happening, but it's happening in the guts of a machine that we don't, we can't see through. Yeah, one of the things that I think this points out is, like one of the um, kind of arguments people have about privacy is, well, if you don't want your privacy to be invaded, or if you're worried about this, you can just kind of opt out. You can like not, not use this stuff, like not use this newest service. But I feel like the insurance stuff and the way that it, the way that these technologies kind of like spider into every parts of our lives, it, it really leaves little room to kind of opt out and you kind of have to be in the system. You either like get the discount or you don't. Uh, you get like better deals on healthcare. And then often um, for, for work, um, you kind of have to do it. Like if you're an Uber driver, you have to give up your, uh, like how you drive. That's like part of the system or like truck drivers. Or um, if you're a, an Amazon delivery person, like, and you visit a house that has the Amazon doorbell on it, like your boss is kind of like watching you as you deliver everywhere um, and, you know, and can see you um, and like potentially could be making, you know, employment decisions, like payment decisions, like all that stuff. And you don't really know. I feel like we're past the point where we, a lot of people can kind of decide, you know, in this high minded way to like opt out of this stuff. Uh, and, and the tough thing is like, this, this is often, as Sarah mentioned, it's not, people making the decision sometimes. You know, like the, when the data gets abstracted and moved around, it, it's not that it's always nefarious at all, but it's also not like a, it's not a human decision. It is a decision based off of, you know, a series of constraints and and uh, approximating a human decision. And that's really weird when it comes to, you know, your, your physical self, where you are, who gets to see what, how, you know, your, your opportunities later on. And it's all based off of this kind of abstracted data that we just shed. And, and I'm just going to add, the people who say that they've opted out, like, are the worst human beings because they almost certainly have never opted out and there's some dude whose wife has a phone and does everything for them. <laughs> like, it's, it's always that, I swear to God. Like, it's... No one actually opts out. You just let your girlfriend get surveilled for you. Um, <laughs> good point. To bring it to a topic that's a little more local, um, Farhad, you wrote in May that San Francisco's Board of Supervisors was right to vote to ban the use of facial recognition technology by the city's police and other agencies. Can you talk a little bit about that for people who might not have been aware of what was going on here? Yeah, I mean, there have been a lot of um, studies and just sort of investigations into how police uh, departments around the country have been rushing toward facial recognition software. And there are just very few, uh, there are like basically no rules about how police can use them. Um, and the kinds, of, uh, the kinds of things they're doing seems like just they shouldn't be allowed in law enforcement. There are stories from New York about how, you know, to try to find someone in a, in a um, to try to find a match from like, you catch someone on a surveillance camera, you need to find a match in the database. Um, you know, in New York, they're allowed to edit the faces to like, there were story, there were um, in some public documents that some researchers got, there were instances where, if they found somebody on a surveillance camera and like the mouth like the mouth didn't match the right mouth shape for like matching it in the driver's license database then they would just go off to google and find like a mouth that better matched it and then like paste it on to their suspect image and then run it against the uh against the system and like you know somebody is going to get talked to by the cops because of this weird search. Um, and there's no rules about whether, uh, you know, you have to disclose how the search happened to like defense counsel, like where it, um, there's no, there are just very few rules about like evidence and just about how cops should use the stuff. Um, and I thought that it was a very kind of bold thing for San Francisco to decide not to do that. So the, the San Francisco rule, as I understand it, only applies to 
um, you know, the police, public agencies, not to like private businesses that may use facial recognition. Um, so it's not like a complete ban, but it's like for the important, I think some of the more important kind of ways that facial recognition can be used. And a number of other um, cities like Berkeley is considering and a number of other cities are doing this or thinking about it. Um, and I think we should just have like, a moratorium on it at least until there are kind of uh, you know regulations that kind of cover this stuff the other thing about facial recognition is not only are police departments rushing to use it but the technology is not very good like it um, it's biased against people of color it finds false matches it um, so it's something that people are rushing to use that everybody knows is not that good so it's like riddled with errors um, and there are no rules I, I went to a facial recognition conference in May in Washington, D.C., which is as dystopian as it sounds. Um, <laughs> and it was a lot of just like private companies and vendors, and there was this like e expo where people were going around, and like the Department of Homeland Security is there, and people are writing checks, and everyone's getting paid, and it's really cool. Um, and I would talk to people, and I think it speaks to your point really well. There was this passing the buck that just happened all down the line. So I would look at the technology and I'd say, well, you know, can it be abused this way? It's like, well, no, no. I mean, theoretically, maybe, yes, but, um, and then I'd say, well, you know, who are you selling it to? Well, when we sell it to law enforcement, we train them. I was like, great, what if they abuse it? And they're like, well, that's, I mean, we did what we did. We, we, we did all the stuff, we checked all the boxes. What more do you want from us? And I was like, maybe don't make it. Um, <laughs> I, or don't sell it yet. Um, and, and, and I just think there's that sort of thing where it's like, it, there's that, and then, you, and then I spoke to some law enforcement people who were there, and they're like, we train our officers very, very well. I was like, what if you have an officer who's biased against, you know, people of color? Or, or you know, what if you just have, like, human error, right? <laughs> or all, and, and nobody has good answers for these things. And I think until we have answers for these things, until we have systems in place, like, it does make sense to, to slow this down. I, 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 I'm sympathetic sometimes to some of the arguments of, you know, we, we want to be able to catch criminals, to make airports safe, to do these things. Like, I get that. I, I, you know, I don't think that it should be some kind of, you know, lawless, completely anonymous paradise where criminals can roam the streets and do whatever they want. But it's also, there's this real idea of just like, we have to move, we have to just keep moving forward. And it's, there's no reason that we can't, you know, consider this stuff and move deliberately. I think facial recognition also like really exemplifies a lot of the concerns about privacy in this way that privacy isn't just about like the invasion of ourselves, right? It is about what happens to our data uh, and how it shapes society, for instance. So even if you're personally okay with your photos being out there, that they're now part of the system that's being used to racially profile people. Like, does that feel good? I don't, like, that's actually very uncomfortable for me. Um, one of the things about facial recognition is that it's not so much that people are being scanned that's the problem, per se. It's that this technology is being used to uh, take these already terrible tendencies in our society, these inequalities, these injustices, make them worse and also come up with a reason for it to happen that doesn't appeal to humanity at all. So now you just have an excuse for profiling someone. Now you just have an excuse for, um, it, it's just stop and frisk with a magic box that you can hold up and be like, oh hey, well this is why I stopped and frisked this person because the computer told me to. And we also know that the computer already has a baked-in racial bias. Uh, I think that the examples I came up with, with like the insurance industry, a lot of these nightmare scenarios that we keep bringing up have to do with the worst parts of American society in 2019, uh, the things that have already gone wrong, and just throwing data and surveillance at it makes them go even wronger. Yeah, one of the, um, the kind of, the thing that got me uh, scared, more scared about facial recognition was last year I, I feel like I got more than a dozen pitches and talked to more than a dozen like startup companies whose whole um, uh, plan is to sell facial recognition uh, technologies and basically c surveillance camera technologies to schools um, as a way to stop mass shootings and other security incidents at schools. Like 
I the thing that really worries me about this technology is that people will buy it because like they see it as a quick, easy fix and something to do for like larger um, and more intractable social and political problems in the culture, and um, and the technology will be used as a way to solve it, but will you know ev probably eventually make everything even worse. We're going to move to audience questions soon, but first I'm just going to ask Sarah one more question that I'm actually dying to know the answer to. Um, has anyone else had this experience where you're talking about something with your friend or your spouse and then the next day you get a Facebook ad for it? Yeah. So there's a rumor that Facebook is listening to us and it's just all very weird and creepy and I'm dying to know, Sarah, what is, what's actually happening okay, here? This is, it's, it's not real. It's not. <laughs> The problem is that advertisers know you better than you think they do. They, they can read your thoughts without actually listening to you talking. So it's literally worse. It's, it's worse than you think, basically. So like, researchers have done, done these experiments with phones uh, where they're like, looking at the data packets going out and like, trying to figure out, oh, what apps are transmitting uh, audio without permission essentially. And there are like some apps, for instance, on Android um, that are not in the Google Play Store. So the ske sketchy apps that you should not download to begin with that do this thing, right? But if you're looking at like an iPhone, for instance, just face or Facebook in general, it's not transmitting audio for advertisers. What's happening is that the stuff that you click, the websites that you visit, the contacts list that's on your phone that Facebook harvests, uh, your phone number, which is tied to all of these little bits of data, the Wi-Fi networks you connect to, your geolocation, the other phones in the same location, the other phones and devices and computers that are hooked up to the same Wi-Fi networks that you connect to, all of that information together makes a very accurate profile of who you are, who you're related to, who you're married to, what you guys are talking about, what you're considering doing next, uh, what you're watching on television, what age you are, uh, what's happening in your neighborhood. What ends up happening is that the advertisers know what you're talking about before you even say the thing. You're very predictable. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very predictable too. Uh, also, you're only noticing it because you notice it when it happens. Um, if, it's, if it's not happening, of course, you're just going to, oh, it's, here's another stupid ad for something I don't care about. Um, but yeah, like this is, it's bad. Like it's really bad. And uh, this myth that phones are listening to people, I trotted out to like Far the last time Farhad and I were on a panel, we were at an advertising conference. So, uh, so it was a, it was a very different audience. Um, and people just kept talking about like, oh, like, no, people people do want want to be tracked. And I was like, no, I, I really don't think people want to be tracked. And I like pull out this example every time, like, listen, people have this fear of being tracked. That's why they make up this myth about their phones listening to them because they don't like the reality. The reality is way worse. Well, this, this is the problem with, with the advertising in, in general, is this like, when it's really good, you're terrified. <laughs> when it's really bad, it's completely, you know, there's no context in your life. You're getting a whole bunch of ads for the kitchen appliance you bought on Amazon six days ago, and it feels frustrating. And so there's like, there, the system is just set up. It, there's really like, there's no real way to win. The, the better it is, the more invasive it feels, the worse it is. It's just you're throwing money down. I the, mean, we're talking about online advertising, though, and yes. like the current model of online. Yes. Like, ads weren't like this like for right. a, you know, most of human history, really. Um, so like, we've just sort of waltzed into a model where we don't, we don't think that it can be any other way. There's like, no way to deliver like, a Super Bowl commercial in an interstitial ad when you're reading like, you know, a TMZ post about Kylie Jenner. You know, like you can't have that good experience. You're, like, no one's ever like, oh man, show me that banner ad again. <laughs> I mean, one of the things, I feel like the really scary thing here that I think about often is where, if you start using this stuff a lot, if you look at Facebook a lot, if you look at the internet a lot, um, I really sometimes wonder how, what percentage of my thoughts are like independent thoughts versus how I'm being influenced by the algorithm, by the advertising. Um, I mean, I'm in, like my job is to write columns for the New York Times. Like I'm in the business of like coming up with ideas to write about. And I am unsure often 
how an idea got into my head. <laughs> and I feel like this is a real problem for society because like these are like what does it mean to live in sort of a capitalist society if you're not sure if like it was of your own volition that you decided to like buy this thing or like go on this vacation like i feel like we're at a point where it's hard to tell what agency we have as users um, and like citizens versus like what the companies are kind of like mind controlling us to do on that mind control note, we are going to move to audience questions. We invited people to send questions in, and some of the people are here tonight. So is um, Eva or Ava Galanis Rosenbaum here? Um, someone will bring you a microphone if you'd like to ask your question. I think you got to a nine on that last answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fully at a nine. Can you, can you hear me? It's on. Can you hear me? Yes? Oh, great, okay. Um, so my question is, how do we draw the line between staying in touch with people, um, you know, far-flung friends, people all over the world or all over the country, um, and, you know, opting out of social networks using or selling our data? Um, you know, basically, how can we stay modern and, um, you know, use the great options of staying in touch with people without compromising our privacy. I don't think you can. <laughs> like, and, and and I think that, that I think that that's like sort of the problem is that it, everything is is built on this, and it doesn't mean that it's all bad, right? It's just like that's why I think we're in this really interesting period. Um, I, I don't, it, there are certain things you can communicate, you know, via in, in, encrypted text messages with people. You can, you know, you can, um, you can use certain, like, like FaceTime, you know, there's very little chance that someone's in, <laughs> gotten in, involved in the middle of that. Um, you obviously can't control the person on the other end if they choose to, you know, take a picture of you or a screenshot or something like that. But I think, I, I think the the real issue is if you want to really be modern, if you want to participate in all this, like you really can't opt out. And I think that's that's the issue that we're dealing with right now. Is and that's why things like regulation are uh, are top of mind because like this is the system that that we live with. We have this, um, and so yeah. I mean, I, I think being very realistic. You know, I I write this newsletter. Uh, this privacy newsletter every week and we have to have like a tip of the week and the tips always feel to me very akin to like um to personal responsibility tips for climate change right where it's like hey should i fly and i'm like i will sure i mean yeah temperature is still gonna go up um it, you there's a collective action that needs to happen um, and it's not gonna, uh, personal responsibility is good, you should protect your privacy in all the ways that you can, but to think that there's some sort of f switch you can flip, besides moving to Montana, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that there really is, and, and, and that's, I think, why we're all here tonight, why this is something worth discussing, why they're discussing it in, in Congress and, and everywhere, because this is, we've built this and we have to deal with it. Um. So I, I have a friend who decided to start doing like Christmas card, like family Christmas cards, like the old school sort of like every year, like, you know, you got the family portrait and then you mail them out to all of your far flung friends. Uh, she, she solicited everyone's addresses through a Google Docs form. Uh, there, there's only so, and I believe she sent the link around through Facebook. Um, but uh, there's only so much you can do, right, because of the way things are set up. Uh, personally, on my end, I have been trying to withdraw away from the social networks and, and really keep in touch with people via, like, text message. Um, and that is hard. Like, I just drop out of contact with people for long periods of time because I'm not good at this kind of thing. Uh, and um, yeah, it's that is sort of the trade-off. Like that is like you're going to have to start actually putting in the work, figuring out that balance if you want to pull away from um, the platforms. But that said, like it's maybe a good thing for you to do that, not for yourself but for your friends, because there are people who would rather 
not have their information exposed to these companies who are your friends, who, are, who have a higher threat profile than you do, um, and you participating in these technologies puts them at risk because of how it works. Do you want to add anything? No, I think that about okay. covers it. There's a, I mean, as I said, there's like a kind of hopelessness to it that it's hard to get around. Yeah. Also, it's not the worst thing in the world to like go back to the days when you saw all your high school classmates at the high school reunion, and that's when you found out what they yeah, were up to. Yeah, you, but right? you have to fly to do it, and that's a lot of carbon. <laughs> that's a lot of carbon. Climate change problems. And it's also like, it, when you do start doing the thing where you, where you do think about this critically, you start to realize some of the ways in which it's incredibly unnatural. Like, I have, I literally have Facebook friends who are privy to any of my photos, and I met them one time in college at a party. Like, that's like me sending my Christmas card 300 times a year to a person you met at a college party. It's very unnatural. Um, so th there are some, you know, uh, it's helpful to think about this holistically. Is Cassie Peppered here? Okay, someone will bring you a microphone. Okay, um, so I guess the question I wrote is, I worked in sales uh, for an encrypted company chat, and so basically those sales didn't happen. Um, <laughs> we were a startup. Um, but yeah, I just know how difficult they can be because companies don't trust their employees, and, uh, and especially in cases of harassment, like with everything that's come out, you know, they really wanna make sure that everything is, um, is forever kept and they can reference it. So just with that constant monitoring of everything you say at work, whether an email or on chat, I kind of wanted to know how you guys would relate that to our private lives or like not so private social media lives because everything is being recorded those eight to 10 hours a day. Yeah, it's really interesting how that happened and we didn't really kind of get a lot of say in the matter. Like, uh, work just became like this place of surveillance. Um, there's, Amazon has a whole program for Alexa at work, um, you know, to kind of control lights and video conferencing. Um, the h huge recent IPOs have all been about cloud companies that, uh, you know, work by like uh, allowing people to communicate like Slack does, but then kind of uh, you know, keep an archive of everything people say, which is like creating an archive that you may not have had before, you know, uh, like you just talk a lot more uh, digitally over Slack than you did over email, and so things are archived more. Um, and of everything you do at work, you know, which, uh, like which office you're in is tracked, like, um, and because it's work, like there are a few rules about it, and I think, I think it's, it's, it sort of tracks, the way that we've been surveilled in kind of consumer life and that it's just become okay for your boss to kind of know everything about what you're doing and keep a record of it. I think there's like a big data problem just in general in, in even understanding. Like sometimes I'll talk, and, and again, this probably like, this doesn't really necessarily relate just to like Google and people who are like using that information in lots of different ways, but there's like, uh, we were talking about school tech earlier and there's a couple of, uh, in some of my reporting, I've talked to a, a few school districts, and they talk about all the information they collect, and you know, and and there's this idea of like more is better. Like the more we have, the better, the, like the better our insights are going to be. The more we can like slice and dice, and, and you know, that's going it's going to make our lives better in some way. And then you kind of keep asking questions down the chain, and it's not clear that they even know what they're going to do with it. It's just like we must collect it because. It's there to be collected, and and I think that like I, I think that there's there's a I, I think the the jury's still out on whether uh, that's always like that always creates the absolute best data sets, and that always you know leads to the absolute best insights, and and what that trade off is, and I, I think I think that we just have this sort of like data solutionism thing where we just think like the the more we have, the more we'll know. 
So uh, I'm sympathetic to the concerns of, of retaining data for uh, sexual harassment inquiries. Um, when I worked on a sexual misconduct case for an investigation like a couple of years ago, um, some of the evidence disappeared because the accused allegedly uh, was a hacker and went back and got into uh, the accuser's Facebook account and got rid of a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of private messages just went missing. Um, but uh, the, but I still think like employers are collecting way too much, right? Like it's it's not just the chats, which that's quite a lot. Um, like we're talking about like sensors at desks and like there's of course all the cameras, but like a sensor that senses like how long you're sitting at your desk or so on and so forth. Um, I mean, we were just talking about all of the things that are wrong with American society and how uh, the surveillance stuff has made it worse. Like this is just another thing, right? Like workers, we don't really have free speech rights against their employers. Workers don't really have uh, um, like all of these anti-union rulings that are coming down, uh, all of these um, pro-arbitration rulings that are coming down. Like it's, it's not great to be an employee in America right now, and this is just another little cherry on top of the terrible pie. <laughs> really like optimistic group here tonight. <laughs> Nine and a half. <laughs> is Jason Kelly here? Okay, he's over there. Hello? How's this? Good? Okay. Uh, so obviously everyone in the room cares about privacy, but sometimes corporations force us to choose between privacy and efficiency. When, in your view, is it okay to choose that, to choose efficiency over our privacy? I mean, I would just say that the way that you frame the question is interesting because I feel like often we don't know what we're giving up in privacy and what we're gaining in efficiency. We, don't, we especially don't know at the kind of when we sign up for the service because you haven't even used the service. Like, you have to agree to the, um, the rules and like the data collection practices that, that Amazon has for Alexa even before you, you turn it on, even before you know like what it's gonna do for you. Um, and I just feel like we don't have the capacity, we don't have the information, we don't have like the overall picture, um, and usually when we start out using the service, we don't even have like any idea of how it's gonna fit into our lives to make that trade off. Maybe over time you can kind of tell, but then, um, like I think about often of, of my Apple Watch, which um, gets, like a level of data about me even beyond uh, what my phone has, which is already like a breathtaking amount, and it kind of ties that into what my phone has, and now it has this like complete picture. Like it, like with with wearable devices, they know how much you're sleeping, they know your heart rate, they know like very intimate stuff about you, um, and I just don't know what they're doing with that. Uh, I know a little bit like why that is kind of useful to me to know how how I slept, but it's not that useful. Uh, it's like, I, I, I just feel like I'm in a void making, making that, that decision. Um, those trade-offs, like, they sound, it sounds interesting in theory to make those kinds of decisions, but, like, I just feel like in practice we, we're not capable of doing it. I, I think there are, obviously, like, like, let's take, like, you know, security, right? Like, things like that, there, there are potential, um, uh, trade-offs and, and things like efficiency. I think where it gets really complicated is, like you said, you don't know what's happening when the, you have to agree to the rules of the game before you've seen the game. But then also, the game really shifts. Like, I, like when we think about a lot of the services that we use, like they started as something and then they grew in, in importance, in size, in, uh, in, in impact, in the way that, like, the, the way that we make decisions. I mean, we've ported all of our lives onto some of these things, and, and you're doing that incrementally. You know, it's, it's the, the frog in the pot of boiling water. All of a sudden, you know, uh, it's, it's really, it's super intense, and the stakes are really high. And that's where I think it really scrambles everyone's brains. Like, how could you have possibly when you downloaded Facebook in 2004, known what you were agreeing to. Of course you didn't. And, and that happens with a lot of things, but I think the speed with which that's happened in the tech industry, um, you know, there's not a lot of parallels there. 
And so I, I think that's really difficult. Like now when I sign up for new services and technologies, I, I try to occasionally do that thought experiment and be like, what, what could this be down the line? And that's, that's kind of a, like, I mean, that's a game you can't win. So we have about seven minutes left, and I'd love to take some questions from the audience. Um, here? No. You, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. You can, first you, and then you with the braids. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I'm curious about how you feel about being identified inaccurately versus being identified accurately. What I have in mind is, for example, if you go and look at your Google profile, and it has sort of a list of the areas you're interested in, and I know when I look at mine, it's sort of meh. You know, it doesn't really capture what I think is me. Uh, you go to, you ego, ego Google yourself, and you notice there's like all these white page, <coughs> white page um, apps that list you and sort of care, you know, supposedly your address, supposedly where you live, try to guess your race, your marital status, and a lot of that you can see for free. And I find that a um, good part of the time it's wrong. Uh, so my tendency is not to try to fix it. Let them be inaccurate. On the other hand, that can lead to issues where Real, real, you know, nasty false consequences, uh, false positive consequences. So I'm curious about your views on that. It's a good question. I, it's one that I thought about often. Like you notice it when you have purchased a product from Amazon and then you are going around the web and like you're being advertised that product for Am like from Amazon and you're like, shouldn't this very smart system know that I already bought this thing? Um, and so you notice, like, I've, I've noticed the thing where, like, you search your name and it has a past address for you, and I've wondered, you know, if someone is after me, they're going to go to the old house. And, like, should I fix that or no? Like, you don't really know. It's a good question. I, I'm not sure whether to correct the things that the surveillance system gets wrong about you or not. It's, um, it's like, yeah, that's a complicated trade-off. I don't have a good answer for that. I think it's it's really tricky. <laughs> okay, we'll take your question. Hi, so I work in product and privacy comms at a big tech company, and before that I worked in media buying, so I'm pretty aware of like what companies know about me, and so I was the person who kept my hand up the longest because all of the things we said we weren't comfortable with, if you have a Facebook or a Gmail or an Instagram or a Twitter or like a computer that's not air-gapped, um, companies probably already know that about you. What, why do you think we use the things we say we're not comfortable with? Is that a result of like, no offense to the room, ignorance or compl like complicit? Like why, right? Like people in this room said they didn't want social media companies tracking what you buy, but Gmail, keeps a list of everything you've ever bought, like every receipt that's ever gone to your Gmail account, every Uber ride you've ever taken. I care about climate change and I flew here for this event for work. <laughs> I, I care about climate change and yet I exhale carbon dioxide. <laughs> I care How about dare climate. you. <laughs> like it's, uh, like I said, I'm not, I'm not joking that I would not be able to find my way here from Civic Center. Like it's my, my ability to find places, I, my boss, um, uh, when that big story about T-Mobile and other companies selling geolocation data in real time um, from phones to like bounty hunters and stuff, when that story came out, she turned her location off on her phone and that lasted 15 minutes until she had to get somewhere and realize that like she couldn't use maps without it. Um, it it's, I think, you know, like there, there's some things that you just can't really get around I mean, like, I want my water to be fluoridated, but I live in Oregon. So now I just have to use a fluoride rinse every night, which that, I don't do that. But of course I would rather my teeth be healthy, but I, I don't remember to do a fluoride rinse. I would rather they put it in the water because it's not dangerous. But it's like, this is a holistic sort of thing. Like we were living in the system where some, we all know that this thing has to change and yet it's not changing because, well, we all know why it's not changing, but it's important to sort of 
ball together and to collective and demand that change. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think about this often um, with regard to like other technologies. Like, think about cars. Like, um, the the thing that happened with cars is like the whole world shifted to accommodate cars and then you couldn't not use a car anymore because things were too far away cities were built in such a way that like you needed a car to navigate it and that's totally the same thing that's happened with all these technologies social networks gmail email in general like slack at work like the the kind of physical and kind of cultural um your social life everything has uh, turn to accommodate these technologies and it's hard to go back it's hard I mean it's it's hard to like not use these things um, and so you have to even though you may have problems with it um, even though you may want stronger regulations like the only way to do it is through collective action um, and like until then you kind of are stuck using them or you're like living in Montana yeah well I I, just because I think we're getting, I, I want it towards the end. Like, I, I do think there is, with all of that, there is like a sliver of, of optimism, potentially, uh, in in the fact that we are having these conversations. Like, you know, this is, again, the world we live in. We've rewired it. The opting out is, a, is basically a fallacy at this point. But the fact that, you know, we're freaking out about face app even you know e even just that cycle that's like a thing that kind of gave me a little bit of hope like people are thinking about like you know the the provenance of their weird app for the first time uh cambridge analytica i think is is a, is a moment that really showed a lot of americans that there are like consequences to the data uh, that's out there. You know, the, the, the 2016 election shows the, the potential power of social networks to mobilize certain people towards certain ends. Like, we're starting to see these things and we're starting to have these conversations. San Francisco with facial recognition. Like, we're, we're moving very slowly, much slower than we need to, but I think there are, there are reasons to be hopeful that, like, we're starting to understand that system. We're starting to understand that, you know, that this is the world we live in, and that's really the only way that you can start to begin to change it, is to know what you're up against. Yeah, I really don't think that we're, like, completely in the dark here. Like, I mean, like, look at this room and all of the hands that went down very quickly. Like, we're in the state of California. You guys have CCPA. Congratulations. Uh, there's, there's real action happening. Um, I mean, the U.S. Senate bill might be dead, but uh, I mean, you, you live in California, so who cares? Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, like your your state representatives are going to be uh, receptive to your concerns about CCPA being amended in ways that you object to. You, you're, they're going to be receptive to you saying that this needs to be stronger. Um, Hopefully, at some point, you, the U.S. Senate will also feel that way. Uh, but like, there is real change in the air. There is things are happening. San Francisco banned facial recognition. Like, we're not actually stuck. Like, we sound like real downers because, like, we are. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, like, have you seen the world though? Uh, but like, but I'm not saying that there's nothing you can do. There's stuff you can do. I'm just saying that this whole thing of like recycle. Uh, and then we can save the planet. That thing, like, we need to put that away. Like, let's let's put that away and let's talk about like, you know, reforming the system and fixing it in a real way, not just a fig leaf on top of uh, uh, an industry that has gone completely awry. I think we're back at eight. All right. Well, I'm glad we ended on a somewhat positive note because we are out of time. Please give my brilliant colleagues a round of applause for their time. We want to thank the San Francisco Public Library so much for hosting us. The New York Times is here with events every month. And next month, we have the Times um, music critic talking about pop songs inspired by California, and there'll actually be a dance party afterwards, so make sure you look that one up. With Way Noise Pop you. and DJ Red Corvette. Thank you so much, and have a thank great you. night, everyone. Thank you. There's flyers in the back for the program.